Welcome to the Intellectual Diversity Podcast. I'm John Tangney, and the guest in this week's interview was Thomas Moore, who is an American psychotherapist and a writer of books on spiritual topics that have included Care of the Soul, Guide for Cultivating Depth and Sacredness in Everyday Life, The Education of the Heart, Dark Eros, The Imagination of Sadism, uh, The Soul's Religion, Cultivating a Profoundly Spiritual Way of Life, a religion of one's own, a guide to creating a personal spirituality in a secular world, and uh, care of the soul in medicine, among many other titles. In the interview, we talked about uh, the history of the soul, the intellectual history of the soul, uh, the ways in which this concept of the self relates to the ways the self is conceptualized in mainstream academia, and we talked about how personal difficulties like depression and failure can be manifestations of soul or can help us to understand the soul in new ways can you can you hear me now you're very clear yes okay good am i I, uh, am i okay for you yeah i can hear you fine oh Uh, good my my uh wi-fi in my house decided to shut down today so i'm doing this on the phone but hopefully it'll be okay (laughs) Um, so you're just back from uh, a trip to Europe, is that right? Yes, I uh, I went to uh, I went to Dublin for about a week, and uh, I told you I gave a talk there. And I visit mm-hmm. I have, my wife has many relatives, and I usually stay with them. I go to Dublin quite often, and mm-hmm. um, I've been going to Ireland since I was nineteen years old, so I I, I feel mm-hmm. very at home there. So I went visited my daughter who was living uh, rented a house in Kerry. And uh, uh, and then uh, I went over to London to visit friends there. And then uh, we went to uh, Malta where I taught therapists for about a week. And then we took a little holiday while we were there. Okay, so a combination so about, of work and play. What, what part of Kerry is your daughter in? Uh, she was in, I always forget the name of the, what is it? Uh, Ken Mare. Do you know where oh, Ken yeah, Lovely place. Yeah, yeah I nice do. place. I have a friend, I have a friend in Ken Mare. Uh, oh, dear. I've visited there on occasion, yeah. Uh-huh. Um, in my childhood, we went on holidays further out the Eva Peninsula every year to... Uh, to oh, yeah, them. yeah. Yeah, favorite yeah. place, yeah. 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 yeah I know. So, uh, yeah, I've, 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 been, uh, I've been following your work for a few years, you know, since I first read oh, uh, this book, The Care oh, of the good. Soul. Oh, good, yeah, great. And uh, it was a book that really... Um, I don't know, changed my perspective in various ways. It, it just, uh, it, it really had a big effect on me. And uh, um, because I, I think because I was just coming out of graduate school where people tended to have a very reductive uh, materialist view of the self. And yeah. uh, even though the soul came into our readings from time to time, it tended to be Aristotle's version of the soul. Or yes, I know. Uh, people tended to talk more about consciousness and about subjectivity than about the soul. That's right. Um, That's right. Yeah. Um, so, how, how did you become uh, interested in the soul? I don't know. You know, I really don't know. I. It seems to me like it was something that was given to me. You know, I like you just have to have to say that. Some for some people, especially, it's uh, it's like your life doesn't go in a direction that you plan. It just it just you respond and things happen. And that's mm-hmm. what I did. So. Mm-hmm. I, I think I, I, I had always, you know, I had been in a monastery for many years and mm-hmm. we talked about the soul all the time. So it wasn't a new idea. But then when mm-hmm. I read Jung, I think I was able to see it more as something that is experienced today rather than a, an object of uh, speculation. So, something that is experienced rather than being an object of speculation. Yeah. So you think that soul is kind of damaged by the attempt to conceptualize it? Yes. Uh, I think we, uh, you know, Freud said that intellectualizing is a form of defense. And I think that's true. That uh, mm-hmm. when, we, yeah. when we intellectualize things too much, we are protecting ourselves from the impact they could have on us. So mm-hmm. uh, I've, I have tried in my writing not to be... Uh, not to do that, not to over intellectualize it. And I don't want to be stupid about it or dumb. I, yeah, I yes. want to be intelligent in the way I present it, but I want to find language that doesn't take the life out of it. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, I studied English literature at university and I often felt that the attempt to account for literature theoretically was something that all, that inevitably diminished it. Yeah, um, exactly. That way. Thinking, yeah. When I was studying, that reminds me, when I was studying religion, my, my PhD is in religious studies mm -hmm. from Syracuse University. And uh, we had an excellent program there. And uh, uh, a part of our program was uh, the study of religion and literature. And mm -hmm. uh, we had a lot of people from, uh, from the, from, from, who are liter literature majors coming to us because we were, not, we were not doing that. We were not making literature technical and abstract, mm -hmm. but connecting it up with the great questions. Yeah, uh, when, when you say the great questions, what is an example of what you're talking about? Well, I mean, religions, uh, I think the, the benefit of the religions is that they do ask, I'm not sure they always answer well, respond well, but they do raise the important questions of uh, meaning, of uh, relationship, ethics, um, uh, death and afterlife, uh, care of soul really uh, care for each other that's yeah. what religions do so i think they raise those big issues and uh, the technical studies that in our universities don't they ignore them i don't, I don't even true. philosophy doesn't seem to do it so and theology doesn't which amazes me so um yeah i think that uh, uh what i've had to do and uh, it's it's been going on for centuries is to talk about the soul outside the university Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly when I was in graduate school, everything was about politics. All literature was yes. about politics. And if you yeah. tried to go beyond politics, you were guilty of uh, ideological blindness in a way. Um, right. And, and your contention would be that the soul is not uh, ideological. Is that, is that correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah, there's, I don't think it's ideological at all. It, uh, um, that kind of that kind of conversation, I guess, has its place, but I don't think it goes very deep. Uh, touches mm. the surface. That's the problem, I think, with many studies today, or even professions like the medical profession, is one I'm quite interested in. I've written mm. uh, uh, one book on that, and I did quite. A, I devoted quite a number of years to working with uh, medicine, and uh, I find that uh, professionals too are. Uh, they reduce experience to quantifications and mm. to uh, technicalities, techniques and uh, strategies, but they don't go very deep. And is this something that's characteristic of the present age or uh, has this been, has this impulse to quantify and to reduce through definition uh, been with us always? It's been with us always. You mentioned Aristotle. For a long time, there was this, distinction between Aristotelian studies and Platonic studies. And mm. the soul was put, it was given to Plato because he did raise a lot of interesting questions about the soul. Aristotle mm. did too, but as you mentioned before, his answers and his response was quite uh, uh, definitional and technical and that sort of thing. He really, Plato wrote dialogues about it and explored it in an yeah. interesting way. And the people who followed Plato, I think, were even better. They were better at at really making uh, existential sense out of questions of soul. But, um, but it's always been with us, this, this tendency to treat the surface and to, and to uh, be happy with classifications and definition. But I think it's part of, a, it has now become the primary mode for our culture. And yeah. uh, that's disastrous as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up Plato and Aristotle, because Plato, even though he's a little bit more literary than Aristotle, he's quite interested in definition in a way, in, this, in the sense that he makes an analogy between the city and the soul, and the boundaries of the city are kind of the boundary of the soul, and it's hierarchically arranged, and he wants to exclude poets from it. And occasionally he made concessions to poetry in something like the Phaedrus, perhaps, but um, he's, he's, uh, I, I, I still find that your version of the soul is more expansive than Plato's and, and is more poetic and more open to, uh, I don't know, uh, surprises and unruly forms of experience 
than Plato. So, and and I've, I've, I, I understand that you you uh, you take some of your view of the soul from Jung, um, but what, what is the what is the longer genealogy of your your view oh, of the soul? Yeah, well, it's it is long and it's complex. Uh, mm. I wrote my dissertation for my doctoral uh, for my doctoral degree at Syracuse in religion. I wrote it on Renaissance natural magic, which mm. is something that a lot of people don't know about or talked about, but there was a long tradition in the West called magia naturalis, uh, natural mm. magic, which is uh, looking at life and how we live this life uh, less rationalistically than most people do, and understanding that much of what we do is by magic rather than by reason and control. I found that very, very interesting. It also turned out that the uh, the people that I studied, uh, and the main figure was Marsilio Ficino from the Florence, mm. uh, were also, they, they focused all their work and their life on soul. And they, they talked about bringing soul into culture, making a soul-centered culture. So magic goes with that, natural magic goes with the soul business. So. Uh, the European, the European uh, Renaissance was very important to me uh, as part of my background. I spent a lot of time, I translated those texts and that weren't translated when I got it, when I would first got into it. So mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time with those texts about soul and uh, that was a big influence. And then later I would say, uh, I was got very interested in uh, someone like Wordsworth and some of the romantic poets. Keats especially wrote some very interesting key things about soul, mainly in his letters. He did in his poems as well, but very clearly in his letters. And uh, so he was a big influence. And then I was quite influenced by uh, William Morris, who looked around in, his, in the uh, 19th century, looked around London, uh, his world there, and found that the Industrial Revolution was desouling society, was taking the soul out of culture. And he responded by a number of ways. He was a poet, but also he gave lectures and talks trying to get people to get back to human, more humanistic uh, values. And um, then he and Edward Byrne Jones, a painter, worked together. They created their own company and they built houses and they, uh, William Morris made wallpaper as his response to a soulless culture. I think that's a very interesting thing that I've explored mm -hmm. in my books. and. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was a big Im impact, big influence. And then in the 20th century, I would say uh, I was quite influenced early, early in my life by Teilhard de Chardin, uh, mm -hmm. who I thought brought uh, spirituality down to earth, made spiritual life and mm -hmm. ordinary life and the physical world all a unit to bringing them together. So that was an important influence for me. And uh, and then uh, Jung, uh, I read Jung very intensely in graduate school and uh, read everything, you know, the whole collective works twice. That was quite a, quite a task. And yeah. uh, then I met James Hillman when I was in graduate school. And to me, the way it works is that all these people that I've talked about in the past weren't really able to articulate this idea of soul terribly well. Jung did it extremely well, I thought. But Hillman made some corrections to Jung I thought were really important. And Hillman wasn't so psychological. He didn't reduce anything psychologically. Jung had a tendency to do that at times. And uh, so Hillman was the main influence for me because he, I thought he brought it all to a pitch. And, uh, and my work is, uh, people sometimes complain that I'm too close to Hillman, you know, that I've done, that I've stuck too close to him. But the fact is he and I were, Though very good friends were very different. He didn't have mm -hmm. all that background I had in, in religion and spiritual life. And mm -hmm. He had a classic humanities background, but he didn't have that interest. And uh, so I tried to do something Hillman never really was able to, to do. I tried to make all of these, this whole tradition, I tried to make it uh, understandable and palatable to the average reader. I see. Um, when I when I talk to people with a Jungian background, um, I often sense a kind of equivocation about the question of God. Uh, do, does belief in the soul involve uh, a belief in God? 
or can it exist without without that? Well, you know, when when Jung was asked that question, he he said that he didn't believe. You know, he that belief was he not an issue. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. and I feel very similarly that I can't use the word belief really, uh, mm -hmm. because I thought, to me it doesn't make too much difference what you anyone believes, you know, anyone can believe anything, you know, it's, mm -hmm. you can believe in the UFOs have visited you last night, that's, that's a belief. Yeah. So it's not that so much, it's that if you, as I understand, I, I, I've, I have a piece, I've, there's an interview I did once and the title of it was, I don't use the word God very much. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's the way it is with me, I don't, I'm very, very, very careful about the use use of the word God. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, in my meditation and in my own life, I understand, I can understand God to mean a window onto uh, what is unknowable essentially, but uh, uh, a window onto, onto the infinite, you might say. And in this, mm -hmm. I'm much influenced by the Upanishads, where they talk mm -hmm. about the soul as being in connection with real, facing the infinite as well as life human life and, and the world. So I like that idea that I want to be, have a window open to uh, the infinite uh, without naming it. And, uh, and I have a long tradition of that, especially in Nicholas of Cusa in the uh, Western tradition. He was very big on that. And all the, uh, the via negativa theologians uh, trying to, mm -hmm. you know, to have a more of a negative approach. So that's my approach is pretty much the via negativa. So I say there's a window, and to live with soul, you need to have that opening to the infinite, just as the Upanishads say. Just at the very beginning of the earliest Upanishads, that's how they start. So that's, that's where I go with that. Okay, yeah. Um, you made a distinction between Plato and Aristotle as uh -huh. uh, exponents of soul a little while ago. And mm -hmm. in this book, The Care of the Soul, you mentioned Epicurus with approbation oh, as somebody yes. who teaches us ways to cultivate soul. And I often tend to think of Plato and Aristotle on the one hand as kind of opposed to Epicurus on the other, and Epicurus as somebody who, in the way that he was translated by early modern people as having contributed to this uh, scientifically based civilization that we have today with its deficit of soul. Yeah. Um, do, do you think, uh, do, do you think we live in an Epicurean civilization in any sense today? No, 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 we don't. I wish we did. No. Yeah. Only, I guess, so I know, you know, I have to say first, there are two sides to Epicurus. I don't know I'm thoroughly, I've had, you know, I'm not a philosopher, but I mean, you know, I haven't studied philosophy academically that way. Just, I, I just mean in the sense that he, uh, he's an atomist who thinks he's that, an atomist. Uh, and, and materialist can be in a way. In terms of, yes, yeah. And, and he doesn't really believe in a transcendent God. No. No, on the other hand, um, uh, I sense in reading Epicurus, I mean, when you say you read him, all we have are these fragments, little pieces that come mm. from other authors. So we don't, it's mm. not much to build on. But yeah. you have the, in Epicurus, the way I see it, you have this atomist and materialist who doesn't believe mm. in the gods or in. Uh, that, but uh, on the other hand, you have Epicurus who develops this philosophy of pleasure. And that's the side of Epicurus that I think opens to soul, because I think soul and pleasure go together very closely. Mm. And desire, desire, pleasure, and soul, or eros and psyche, you know, the, the, that, whole, that whole theme in Greek uh, history, mm -hmm. eros and psyche, I think is essential to soul. So. The relation between pleasure and soul is really important. And I think, uh, in fact, I know that the people who have written about soul in Western history for a long time have been Epicureans, not in the atomist, not the atomist sense, but the pleasure. So Ficino, for example, called himself an Epicurean um, most of his life and, uh, and quoted Epicurus frequently in his writings. And basically on pleasure, how important pleasure is, voluptas, pleasure is mm -hmm. to, uh, to the soul. So I think that is very important and developing an Epicurean life is important. I've also tried to make the case that Jesus and the gospel philosophy is Epicurean essentially. It's based on mm -hmm. friendship. He's, Jesus is so much like Epicurus in his teaching and what he teaches and how he teaches. 
So um, yeah. I tried to make that point, that the case for that, that Jesus is one of the great Epicureans. So, so you think Epicureanism is com compatible with belief in an afterlife? I do, I do. Well, uh, I think Epicurus believed the same. He talked about it that way, didn't he? I, I, Did he? I, 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 I know him primarily through Lucretius, actually. But, yeah, um, sure. I, well, I, I don't uh, think Eddie, Lucretius believed that. No, no. Maybe I'm wrong about that, that there is no afterlife there. I just remember his statements. You know, it's famous that Epicurus talked about uh, uh, that he wanted some pleasure as he was dying. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess that doesn't really suggest an afterlife. But uh, yeah. he, was, he was a very pious, uh, I think, interesting person, nevertheless. I, I've written a book and recently called A Religion of One's Own which is uh, an attempt to, to set out how we can be, be spiritual, or people use the word spiritual. I continue to word, use the word religious myself, but to be spiritual, let's say, in a post-religious time, in a post-religion period. Yes. And uh, so in that sense, then I would say that I could see that Epicurus had a lot of, uh, in my language, he was quite a religious philosopher, but... Uh, but yeah. never, but yet, and his own ideas were materialistic and atomistic. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. It's <laughs> it's interesting uh, the way you talk about Epicurus because one of, you know, as I said, I come from uh, the discipline of English literature, and one of the critics whom I think of as most alive to the quality of soul, even if he doesn't use that term, is Harold Bloom, who I think comes from Epicurus much more than he does from. Oh yeah. From. Yes. from, from yeah. Um, and yeah, I, I think it's this uh, this quality of uh, spontaneity in uh, Epicurean uh, philosophy that uh, that lends itself to literary criticism, whereas Plato is quite concerned with uh, with defining things and fitting them into a taxonomy in a way. That's that's certainly true. I I've never I have to confess I've never been able yet to work out the problem with Plato of him. It's, he has some really interesting things to say about the soul. Mm -hmm. I'm particularly interested in, I've often quoted his, uh, his dialogue of Euthyphro, where he talks about mm -hmm. therapy. And also yes. about, uh, he also talks about, I forget the Greek word now. Uh, it's translated piety usually, but I think what yes. it means is uh, uh, a, a spiritual sensibility or a religious sensibility. I've seen it translated as holiness as well, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I, I, but the Euthyphro, he does, he, uh, Socrates, the student of Socrates asks him, what does therapy mean? Well, that really caught my eye because I'm a therapist and yeah. I'm trying yeah. to see that uh, psychotherapy, of course, the Greek word psychotherapy really can be translated easily, care of the soul, you know, just what the word means, mm -hmm. psychotherapy. So he, in that particular dialogue, Socrates says that therapy means service or care. I see. Um, so what's the difference between uh, spirituality and soul? Are they? They're, they're, they're very, very closely related, but they can be distinguished. Mm -hmm. And Hillman did that and, and Jung did it mm -hmm. a little bit. He started the ball rolling in that direction. Uh, it depends, you know, the words are used differently over different periods of history and also yeah. by different people today. But the way we, we, I say we, those in this tradition that I'm coming out of, we distinguish between spirit and soul. So soul mm -hmm. really would have, as we work it out, has more to do with depth and uh, with, uh, uh, it's embedded in ordinary life. So we like, I like to write about the importance of home and family and attachments and, uh, uh, animals, relation to animals, and uh, uh, that sort of thing as being really soul, uh, soul experience mm -hmm. as very important ones that are neglected often mm -hmm. as for their importance. And spirit having to do with that which takes us out of ourselves, which either into the future, like uh, science fiction or uh, speculation about the future, it can be very spirited even NASA sending off uh, rockets and probes into space is a very mm -hmm. spirit move. And, um, and spirit might be definitely part of religion and meditation, usually an attempt to, get to, to be separate from body and uh, affections and attachments. 
that kind of meditation, I would think, would be more spirit oriented. But the two do work together so that most of the time it's very hard to separate them or distinguish one from the other. But still, I think it helps to distinguish them. I see. Um, so uh, how do you, you have mentioned in your books that you, uh, you kind of had a falling out with academia and, and then you went into to therapy. Uh, I think academia had, a, academia had a falling out with me, really. I, I wanted to stay in it. I, I loved the idea of uh, teaching at university. I, I taught for seven yeah. or eight years. More than that, yeah. probably 10 or 12 years. And, um, and uh, Hillman told me when I first started teaching at the university, he said, you know, you won't last, probably won't last long because soul and universities don't go well together. And mm -hmm. It's true that the university, the, my department, the religion department, didn't like what I was doing too much. I wasn't, I wasn't teaching religion in the usual way. Uh, mm -hmm. My my brief was to teach religion and psychology. I thought I was doing it the way they was appropriate, mm -hmm. but they didn't think so. They didn't like the fact that I wouldn't write for the for the jury journal journals because I hate that kind of writing that they mm -hmm. wanted. Yeah. I couldn't write that way. So eventually they told me that uh, they felt that my writing and my teaching wasn't uh, appropriate for the university and they denied me tenure, which allowed mm -hmm. me then the opening to, I, I had prepared myself anyway for to be a psychotherapist. So I was able to do that right away, get a license and start practicing. And also allowed me to write to care of the soul, which as you know, really gave me the, a financial base, which I never had. I never had any money in my life. I, I was mm -hmm. able then to raise my family and and not worry about uh, having to teach for a number of years. It, you know, you can't do that forever, but I did it for quite a while. I still I still make my living writing. Yeah. Um, I, I've read uh, James Hillman's book um, uh, about finding your calling, about the daimon, and did you, did you feel that there was some kind of daimonic energy directing you out of academia? Totally. To being a parent? Yeah. Totally. Complete. That's what I was saying before, that my life has been totally daimonic. It's, uh, the, the, the daimon speaks. Sometimes I listen and sometimes I don't. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, when I do, it works out quite well. And uh, sometimes I use the word angel for it because I, I mean, I, I relate it all to this, the paintings I, I, I study of the Annunciation, where the angel appears mm. to, the, to the kind of the meditative yeah. soul, you know, the Virgin Mary meditative soul, sitting there reading a book usually, in almost all paintings she reads a book. Mm. So uh, I figure that's when the angel appears and comes to me at times and says to move on and it's over here. And I, 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 mm. I pretty much listen to that all the way. Mm. What happens when you don't listen to the diamond? Oh, it's trouble. I think it's great trouble. And uh, mm. really, I mean, I think you can get into real trouble. In the sense that uh, uh, sometimes, you know, Socrates uh, uh, says this, I believe. Socrates, he talks about his diamond being love, a love diamond. But he says that it mainly tells him what not to do. Not so much mm. what to do, but what not to do. That's not been true in my case. The daimonic for me has been a positive thing. Tell me what to do. Sometimes don't do this, don't do that. If I don't do what it says, I'm lost and I have to, I, I can get eventually get back around to where I need to be. But I get lost for a while and I need to get back on into it. And that's how I've lived. I live daimonically. Um, Yates talks mm -hmm. about the, the same. Yates uses the word daimon too. I mm -hmm. think Yates, Yates lived that way as well. And, you know, he, his life did not, Yeats's life did not fit a very uh, conventional form at all. I and mean, he was, he was yeah. very, very, had a very odd structure to his life and direction to his life. And it looked chaotic in many ways, but uh, I think he was a daimonic person too and lived that way. Yeah, uh, you were, I, I think in response to what you just said of his lines about how the, uh, the soul of man is forced to choose perfection of the life or of the work, and if it chooses the latter, it is condemned to raging in the dark or something like that. Yes, right, but, right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, he, he, he felt that somehow he was uh, raging in the dark. He was. 
Totally, yeah, and yeah. that's how it feels. I think when you live daimonically, it's a lot of it is in the dark because you're not you're mm -hmm. not living by plan. You are mm -hmm. willing at a moment's notice to uh, to make a shift. Yeah, and you know, often people experience themselves as having conflicting voices within themselves. And how, how do you tell which is the daimonic voice and which is uh, I don't know the voice? Well, I think if I think the answer to that is if you if you live daimonically enough, you get to learn. You learn from your experience. Mm -hmm. You learn how to how to make that distinction. What the what voice is worth listening to? To me, I must say that it's it's as clear as can be. I um, I've never mm -hmm. had a problem distinguishing those two things. Uh, when that voice of the angel comes through, there's no there's no confusing it with a temptation from somewhere or some other thing. No, there's no I, I don't think it's difficult to, to distinguish it. Hmm. So um, you, one of the things that's interesting about Jung uh, as a philosopher is that he focuses very much on the second half of life, I think. And, and he thinks that you know, people often experience a, a midlife crisis and maybe a, you know, uh, some kind of a daimonically driven change of direction in the middle of their lives. Um, can you can you explain that? I mean, how, how does that? Work? I don't. I don't agree with that. I've I've never liked that yeah. part of Jung. There are many aspects of Jung's thinking that I don't agree okay. with. I'm not, that's why I'm not a Jungian analyst, or I'm not a Jungian actually. Okay. Although I I speak and teach to Jungians all the time, I, because I owe so yeah. much to Jung. But that part yeah. of it, I don't. I don't. I'm not convinced of. I I don't. It's. I think having having gone through Hillman, looking at Jung through Hillman. Uh, Hillman is much more about uh, multiplicity and polytheism. Many, 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 always many things. Not You don't split things into one and two. Two is a very bad number. I would never, mm. I don't like to have anything say first half and second half or one and two or this and that. Two is a very bad number. I never use it. Mm. Now Hillman, Hillman would suggest not stopping at three or four, but go beyond that. So I think there are many stages in life, and that's the better way to look at it, many stages. And uh, so I would rather say the first eighth of life or the first 15th or something. Mm. I, I'd rather divide it up into smaller piece, chunks and see that uh, uh, it's not as neat as that uh, first half and mm. second half. So it doesn't, that doesn't mean much to me. Okay, okay. Um, so uh, I, I, I remember you using this uh, phrase, the gifts of depression uh, in, your, in your work and, yes. and uh, seeing depression and, and maybe other kinds of symptoms as messages from the soul. What, what, what do you think are the gifts of depression? Oh, there are many. Oh, many gifts of depression. Uh, well, to, to classically, they were given, I got this idea from medieval textbooks, medical textbooks where they talked about depression as offering mainly two things, uh, weight and age. Those are the two main gifts, according to medieval books. So I think they, that still holds that uh, depression, if, if, if you've never been depressed, if you don't get depressed about things that are happening in the world, uh, then you're going to be too light. You're, you're, you're gonna to be too light and that's a problem, I don't know. If where you live, you have that experience. But in America, for a long time, we've had too light an existence. Now it's getting a little mm -hmm. dark. I think people are feeling the weight in the past uh, 10 years. But uh, for a long time, America was far too light. The, the, the psyche was too light. And depression then, mm -hmm. Hillman used to say this depression is a response to that lightness. Trying, it's more or less correcting the, uh, the, you know, what's going on there. So weight is an important thing, giving us weight, authority, um, taking life seriously. A lot of people don't take life very seriously. Mm. And uh, so I think, I think the seriousness is a gift of depression. Second gift of depression is age, which is uh, we need to have a, our, our soul needs to age to, 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 to mm. feel older and wiser and, and uh, experienced and uh, acquainted with life and uh, mm. uh, if you meet somebody that you want to talk to or talk over your situation with you want someone who has been around who has both weight and age so mm -hmm. depression gives those two things I think they're the 
two most important things. There are other things, but those are two most important. I've noticed in things that I've read about depression that people talk about it as a, in terms of a, you know, a sense of feeling empty sometimes, and yet it also confers weight. And there's, there's something paradoxical there that has to do with the, uh, the nature of materialism uh, and, and the ways in which matter has no inward, as, as, uh, as Coleridge says, or, or you know, when you try to get at the essence of matter by dissecting something, you find yourself proliferating the surfaces of things. And somehow whatever it is that's, that gives weight to matter is, is within the self rather than within matter. Yes, and, it's, uh, like, it's like someone, I would say it would be like somebody who doesn't feel they have any weight in life. And so they, they go out and try to buy everything they can. They try to make mm -hmm. enough money so they can purchase. And they are trying to purchase weight. And it doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. It's, it's doing it externally and uh, symptomatically rather than in a way that really has, a, has effect. So that's one of the yeah. problems. The other thing about emptiness though, and depression that you raised is that uh, that word comes out of uh, Buddhism, shunyata, and it's a, it's mm. a very, it's a very uh, important and uh, weighty concept, even though it's emptiness. Uh, it's about mm -hmm. emptiness. There's an emptiness and depression that I think is probably related to shunyata. It's, mm. uh, it's an emptiness that, uh, that can actually give you something and, even though it's painful, doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what little I know about Buddhism is something that I've always found a little depressing, actually, when it's, when it's talking about <laughs> emptiness. Yeah. Um, so, um, given, given that we suffer from a deficit of soul today, perhaps because of, the con because of our consumer culture and our focus on externalities and uh an excess of lightness in our culture is is there a way that we can uh i don't know impose soul on people as a matter of policy or how does one bring soul into the world i think that's a good question i think that we're really we need a, a shift in our in our thinking this is what i've been very reflecting on a great deal lately is to try to see if there's a way to counter the, uh, uh, the direction that we're going with uh, making everything mechanical and uh, mm. uh, technical. So what, one of the things, uh, and I, this I get mainly from uh, William Morris, so one of the things I'd like to do is start writing now more about uh, other, other aspects of life. Uh, I, I've referred to it sometimes as soft evolution. A lot of times we mm. think of this kind of hardware evolution. We think that we're going to evolve by having bigger and better machines. It's a mm. pretty sad way of thinking about our future. I'd rather think about better marriages and raising children more effectively and creating peaceful environments and communities. There's so much that I would call that soft evolution. We're moving in a mm. direction where we can uh, have these, uh, these softer qualities uh, uh, be our attention. So that's what I'm going to be working at to try to, to, to suggest ways in which we can we can shift our values. It's the only way to do it. I don't, you can't impose a soul culture. You can't, it doesn't yeah, happen that yeah. way. But, it, but cultures do change and it doesn't take much. Sometimes a book will change a culture or, mm -hmm. or a, one person can make a huge impact on how the culture moves and shifts. Yeah, I, I suppose you can't change culture, but you could do something like change the, na change the nature of educational institutions, perhaps. Yes, if, if you, you could were, do given control over a, over a university, how would you change things? First of all, it's never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I've thought about that a lot. I've, I've been working for years on an article with the dean of a school of the university called The Soul of the University. And um, what, I would, what I'd want to do would be to emphasize to get away from what's called STEM. Now, STEM is often uh, discussed, I don't know if you know that, uh, yes, uh, yes. science, uh, technology, engineering, and math. Uh, that kind of emphasis has got to shift. I'd want to move to an emphasis on art, uh, spirituality, uh, and spiritual. I mean, art, spirituality, and uh, uh, probably the... Uh, uh, human communication, uh, the humanities in general, and human communication. There are other things we can 
study that really are important. If we could bring those into the foreground, just as people have brought STEM, I would want, I guess I'll have to get an acronym for it so that I can bring it into the, into the modern thinking. But I think that could be an interesting way to uh, make a shift. And I, as I said, it doesn't take much, so we have to work on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, when, I, when I was in graduate school, I remember uh, a number of people talking about the medical humanities and yes. there were attempts to bring the humanities into the practice of medicine. But yeah. I always felt it was a little bit of a branding exercise more than something that was actually bringing the quality well, of soul into, uh, into education. As I said, I've I've spent a lot of time with medicine and medical education and uh, have a lot of experiences in various medical schools and conferences, places like that. And I'm, I, I used to be invited frequently when I was putting myself out more as being interested in that area. I don't, I'm not invited much anymore, but I used to be. And I would go there and I'd be usually the last speaker because I'd mm. sum things up by saying we need to bring more humanities in the human factor into the practice of medicine. And people were interested, but not too seriously. You know, they would say, oh, how nice. But then they really wouldn't, couldn't imagine actually bringing it in. And then the usual complaint would be uh, residents uh, who were the least open to me. The, that means that, I mean, the uh, doctors just beginning to go into their practice, just fishing up their mm -hmm. education. They were very difficult. And they told me there was no time in the study of medicine. We couldn't add anything else. They're already overworked. Don't have any time left to do anything. So they can't sit around reading humanities, reading yeah. novels. They can't do that as part of their, their uh, pre preparation for medical, a medical life. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one of the things about the humanities as I've experienced them in universities is that they're more about post-humanism and anti-humanism now. Whereas when you talk about soul, you're tracing your your genealogy back to humanists who are considered yes. to be in some way naive by by the uh, the latest generation of people That's working right. in the humanities. That's yeah. right. We're considered naive. That's right. So when I talk to people like doctors or business people and that, groups or professional groups, I make a real point to try to present my ideas about soul as, uh, as formally and substantially as I can. I don't try not to make it in any way sound like some new age, uh, you know, counseling mm -hmm. kind of approach yeah. to things. I'm trying to do it in a way that really has weight. I think it's a very, very important to be able to speak to people out there that we do it with a great deal of gravitas, otherwise we'll be dismissed totally. Mm -hmm. So you, you derive that gravitas from being versed in a tradition, would you say? Yes, partly, yes. Uh, yes, I don't, I tell them I, none of these thoughts are mine. They're all, they've been mm -hmm. around for centuries and I'm presenting them somewhat, sometimes with new translation, just to make it clearer. But uh, mm. they're, these are not off the top of my head. This is a long tradition that needs to be uh, revived and spoken for all the time. Mm -hmm. And do you think that your interest in the soul and your attempts to give the soul gravitas by relating it to a tradition gives you a particular position in relation to contemporary politics? I mean, does it place you somewhere on the, on the political spectrum? No, I don't think so. I haven't seen any evidence of that. Um, I uh, I have uh, I have tried to get my get, I tried to get into the political arena occasionally at times I've spoken at the in America here I've spoken at political conventions, um, but people uh, people are not terribly interested because they're so caught up in the game of politics. And that's something I think that's very interesting. I, you know, one could easily write a, a book about uh, politics as play and game. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't mean that seriously, you know, within the whole yeah. context of all that literature on play and game that's around. So uh, I think that uh, the people don't get so caught up in the, in the literal game of politics. Who's, who's going to win? Who's going to lose? And what is our strategy? And where are we now? Uh, that they can't look at the bigger issues. They're really, they're really uh, uh, overcome. They are, they are in a fog of, uh, of the game. 
and they can't stand back and even understand that it is a game or ask, ask the bigger questions around it. I see, I see. Um, so one of the things that I have found interesting about uh, your work and James Hillman's work and uh, some other people who write about the soul is that uh, you talk in various ways about failure as being an important uh, part of one's life experience. Uh, I guess this is related to the role of depression or the, the, the messages of depression. Um, but what, why is failure important or how does failure function in people's lives? Well, first of all, failure is uh, related. It goes along with other qualities like imperfection, ignorance, mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. So failure is, uh, you know, what Keats said, by the way, Keats said that, uh, oh no, what did he say now? He said, I'll have to go back to it. But he said that uh, the, ro the role of failure is to uh, school an intelligence and make it a soul. That uh, mm. he talked about negative capability and, uh, and yes. failure and perfection, ignorance as being there to make a soul and not, and, and to give intelligence its depth, essentially. So that's how I would, I would look at it, that failure pulls us up, stops us, and makes us think. And we have to reassess where we're going. We failed, we have to reassess it in some way. And that kind of reflection is really what soul work is all about. So failure really serves so success doesn't serve it too well because mm -hmm. I often say that you know people rarely call me up and ask me for a therapy session because yeah. things are going well. It's not yeah. they only want to talk when things are are bad when, when they're in trouble. So failure is one of the failure is one of the experiences we have that invites us to reflect, and that reflection is uh, is a starting point for soul work. Yeah. Um, so, so what is the what what is the uh, I don't know the telos of that work of soul work uh, if if it's approached through failure. Well, it's, uh, it, it's, it's you know that's it's quite Keats would have said it's it's that's what it is. It's soul making. It's it's soul is yeah. the is the telos is the object of it. So, um, but if I know you want you 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 would expect more more about that. So I would think that um, uh, another thing that failure does, it connects us with our humanity because mm. uh, if you don't fail and you don't deal with failure, it's like you don't have really have an experience of what it means to be human. Uh, mm. Your humanity, human beings almost are, are more defined by their failure than by their success in many ways. Or how do you deal with failure? Can you can you take it in? Can you feel it? Do you have the capacity to take the disappointment and disillusionment of failure in? That gives you a full range of emotion and of character, develops your character. And if you don't have that capacity, how can you have much character? Because you haven't had it, you haven't had to sort that all out and, and be able to live and go on and be creative and positive and optimistic, even with the failure. But so this is raises that very interesting question of being optimists in a time of pessimism. Not the great reason for pessimism. I think that this talk about soul helps that because the soul is made up of, you might say, as much as much pessimism as optimism and as much failure as success. And you can't really have one without the other. They define each other. Um. Yeah, I, I taught a course on uh, depression and literature last year, and oh. I was struck by some of the uh, the writers we read who were afflicted by depression at the moments of their greatest success. For example, William Styron, who wrote a book called yeah. Darkness Visible about his experience of, you know, the worst kind of clinical depression, and it came over him as he was being honoured by uh, a, a major French literary prize. And oh. you know, do, do, do you? Do you think that uh, people who haven't failed enough are more prone to depression or something like that? Yes. Yes, I think that I think that's true, that there, you might be prone. It's not automatically so, but mm. you might be prone to depression if you uh, haven't failed much because uh, you need it. I mean, that, that mm. takes, uh, it, it's the other side. It's the very thing that you haven't 
uh, that hasn't uh, come to you to develop your character. Character is so important to develop one's character and to be someone mm -hmm. who can be uh, reflective, thoughtful, ethical, uh, responsive, um, uh, help the young, see your role as, this is about aging, being as you get older to be able to help the young, do something mm -hmm. for them, that's so important. So there are certain human, basic human qualities that we, we don't think about much these days, but are, are really essential to, as, to be a real human being. If, if you're not interested in being a human being, if you just want to live unconsciously and gather as much material possessions as you possibly can, not knowing even that that is all symptomatic, it's not really giving you what you're looking for, um, then that's, that's who, who, what can you say? That's just where we are. But if you uh, have the spark of life in you, where you want to, you know that you, you, your life has a, a purpose and part of that purpose is to develop some character and individuality, identity, then, uh, mm. then you'll be interested in that. You want to have a, a range of experiences, including depression. Yeah, and yet, you know, the, the, these experiences of failure can often drive people into depression and sometimes to suicide. And there, there seems yeah. to be something very real at stake here. I mean, it's not guaranteed that you're going to come no. out the other end of this experience. No, not that at seems all. To be important. Yeah. No, not at all. But see, the, I mean, that's the whole point, isn't it? That you, you need some way to be pessim or to be depressed or, opt or pessimistic to the, in a way that we, it doesn't do you in so yeah. that you are able to hold it, able to contain it. Mm -hmm. Now, sometimes it's not just, I think very often it's not just about being able to do that ourselves, but to have the good fortune to have someone help us, to have mm -hmm. another person, a friend or a therapist who can help us or a book. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I think the greatest reward I have from my work is that I get letters almost every day, emails from people almost every day telling me that one of my books has helped them at one mm -hmm. of these times. And I figure that's my job as a writer. That's what, that's what my, I don't know about other people, but for me, that's my job as a writer. Write books that people will be able to pick up and say, here's another human being who has been able to support me at a time where I couldn't fall into despair. So I think that's what, you know, that's who we are. I'm writing a book right now. It's almost finished on, uh, on therapy, uh, speaking therapeutically to each other on this theme of how important it is that we, that we care for each other's souls therapeutically. Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do, you think, um, do you think depression always comes as a message from the soul? I mean, there are a lot of people who would say that clinical depression is you know, some kind of uh, chemical event in the brain rather than, uh, you know, a spiritual message or a spiritual, a part of a spiritual journey. Do, would you distinguish between those kinds of depression? No, or, no, I wouldn't. No, not? because I would say that the, what I always say is that there's no such thing for a human being as something that is biological or physiological. Mm. There is no such thing as a human being. Mm. As a human being, mm. everything that happens to you is meaningful. Even, mm -hmm. even if you have a, uh, 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 something going on biologically in you, you know, that is still mm -hmm. only a piece of it. It's a meaningful experience for you. So um, there is no such thing, I think, as pure clinical depression for a human being. There mm -hmm. is no such thing. I've had many letters from people who are hospitalized or going through very severe depression telling me that of what I've written about depression has been a, an aid to them because it makes them feel he like a human being even though they're going through yeah. this. This medical yeah. approach that says this is in your brain makes you not feel like a human being. It's not a meaningful event. You just have to take, mm -hmm. a, take a pill yes. for it or something. So yes. I think that's part of our problem rather than part of the cure. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so uh, I, I asked you already about how one would implement soul politically, but just individually. I mean, how can we cultivate soul in our lives? Well, there are tons of ways of doing it. One of the one way is to uh, live. Uh, I think the gospels are about living a soulful life, mm. um, living f uh, from uh, friendship and love. I think you know that if you look at the literature on soul in Western writing, 
Almost all those writers have also written about friendship, a separate uh, piece on friendship. Friendship is so important to the soul. I think that uh, Jesus presents this in the Gospels this way, that his, his mode, his mode of being is friendship, his mode. He starts out that way. Everything he does is, is based on the principle of friendship. Mm. And I'm not saying that as a Christian or anything. I take the gospel as the same as I would Plato, you know, trying to give us some deep insight into human experience and a way out, a way out of our suffering. So, uh, so I think that uh, that's very important to me that we have that idea of model of friendship. That's a good uh, way to start uh, caring for your soul to, to uh, have your friends speak uh, openly to your friends rely on your friends and cultivate the friendship and be with them when you can. I don't want to be hypocritical when I say that because I'm rarely with my friends. My, my good friends are all over the world, but I see them once a year. Maybe. Mine too, yeah. yeah. yeah but we communicate with each other all the time. Yeah. So uh, that's one thing. Another, another thing would be uh, to do everything uh, with some form of love. There are many different kinds of love. I think just being interested in something is a form of love. There are a lot of ways in which you can have love in your life as your, your motivation. So I think that's also the teaching of the gospel and teaching of the Buddha. So, uh, and, uh, uh, so I think that, uh, that that's another way to, to have soul in your life or to, to uh, be with your neighbors or to uh, pay attention to your home, to develop your home. Mm in such a way that you feel at home, you have security, you belonging, you are attached. Attachment is very important to the soul. So uh, to be able to be attached to a place, find a place in the world, this is Ficino's idea. First thing he says you should do in caring for your soul is live in the right place. Mm -hmm. Find the place you need to live right now. It may not be forever, but right now, be where you need to be. And he would say, be in a tune with the sky, you know, whatever the sky has in mind for you. Have that sense of a cosmic uh, design for you and make sure you're in the right place. Hmm. Um, you know, if we're to believe the canonical gospels, Jesus was not married. Um, but I have heard, uh, I have heard certain Jungians saying that it's necessary to have uh, a husband or a wife in order to be a fully realized human being. How, how important do you think that kind of intimate relationship is to, uh, to, to leading a soulful life. I don't know why people make these pronouncements. It doesn't make any yeah. sense to me. How we should live. Yeah. You have to do this or you have to do that. That's, that's silly as far as I'm concerned. I'd rather make the, the, the pronouncement that we all should find our way. And it's mm -hmm. going to be very different for each of us. Right now, our ways are too circumscribed. We are pigeonholes we have to get into rather than our own individual ways of being. So uh, some people, in other words, some people may have to be uh, married and then single. I mean, mm -hmm. what I'm saying is that they, that you don't make it forever, that it may, they have to make, maybe they have to make a move. Maybe they have mm -hmm. to be both at the same time, who knows? There are mm -hmm. yeah. many different ways. Jung, you know, Jung was apparently, I don't know much about his private life, but apparently, um, according to the stories, he was, he was not very monogamous. He was, Mm. Yeah, he had two or three wives essentially. So, uh, yeah. you know, that's what he did at night. I don't fault him for that. That's if he was able to work that out in his life, and that's great. But I think yeah. that's an example of someone they call it polyamorous, I guess, today. That's an mm. example of someone who was able to work out in his life what he felt his soul needed. And uh, that's not easy to do usually. And we all find different ways of making that happen. But we are mm. so concerned about what society thinks that we don't really put in those terms. We'd rather try to say who we are according to social norms. So I think that's a silly, irresponsible thing for people to say that you should be married or yeah. not. Yeah, that leads me to one of the things that I find most interesting about soul, and, and it's, that is its relationship to social norms and the ways in which it often seems to invite us or impel us to violate social norms. And I think particularly of the lives of writers and artists and poets who have given us these incredibly uh, soulful works and yet have often been uh, considered very imperfect in the ways that they lived their lives. And I'm wondering, what is the relationship between this kind of soulful violation of social norms and uh, real evil of the kind that 
Uh, I remember James Hillman talking about him in his book on the diamond. Yes, um, it's a really complicated issue. It's it yeah. it connects up with do you have to be insane to be an artist or do you have to be highly mm. troubled? Or, um, yeah. I I think again I think that there are many many ways of doing this. Take Wallace Stevens, maybe one of the greatest of American poets. Do you know him, Wallace Stevens? I do, yes. Yeah, just a I wonderful do. poet, yeah. and. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry I asked that because not not everybody has has uh, come across that's, Stevens. That's, yeah, no, he's 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 one of my favorite poets. Oh, good. So Wallace Stevens, you know, he was uh, he decided that he would live uh, as an insurance executive. That's how mm. he made his living. He lived in Hartford, mm. uh, Connecticut, which is a, uh, an insurance town, and he was an executive in this company, and he made a good living and. Uh, he said he didn't want to be a starving artist, but I think he also didn't want to be a crazy artist. He, he lived this very sane life. At the same time, he wrote poetry that really burst the boundaries on a lot of, a lot of ideas. So uh, that's, uh, you know, that's an example. You can be very conventional or you can be really weird like Emily Dickinson who people don't know if she was crazy or what, uh, that she dressed in white. I mean, she, to me, she was like a nun. She was a very spiritual person. She decided to wear white. Well, nuns have done that. You don't call them crazy. Um, yeah. And she didn't talk to people. Well, you know, she was cloistered. She was kind of cloistered in her room. So mm -hmm. it's hard to know whether she was a highly spiritual person or wacky, you know, one or the other, mm -hmm. highly neurotic. Mm -hmm. So with the artist, I think uh, we have to allow a great deal of latitude and not make uh, not make any pronouncements about how anybody should be. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, one of the things that was kind of in the back of my mind when I asked that question about the artist was maybe uh, Paul Gauguin in the way that he's depicted in Somerset Maugham's book, The Moon and Sixpence, as this guy who in middle age abandoned his family and went to yes. ultimately to the South Seas to pursue, pursue an artistic vocation. And it, was, it seems like a story about almost demonic possession uh, yeah, yeah. Of, of, of somebody who was living a normal life and yeah so I, I'm just wondering like where does one draw the line between you know artistic violations of convention and you know somebody who maybe does genuine evil to people by you know, uh, abandoning his family or deliberately giving people syphilis in, in the ways that Paul Gauguin is said to have done or you know even more extreme forms of evil that are um, in violation of convention. Well, uh, most of us do, do some bad things in our lives to people. Mm. We are insensitive and do things that really hurt them that mm. um, we may feel just hey, we just have to do. And uh, mm. so it's part of life. I think part of this idea of shadow and Jung is, to, is not a superficial thing at all. A lot of times it's psychologized mm. away to be almost nothing. But I think it's much closer to what you're describing that we we all approach certain moments in our lives where we come very close to uh, you know, being responsible for some evil in relation to someone else. So mm. it's not an easy judgment to make. I don't think we should. Uh, mm. I don't think we can make these large categorical statements about mm. about that. However, if you look at a life like uh, Gauguin's, then you. You have to say that, um, you know, is it really, we need to discuss it. Is it really okay to feel that you, uh, well, now your, your own inner daimonic life has reached a point where you have to abandon your family. It's necessary for you and for your survival. Well, you know, big deal. It looks pretty narcissistic to me, you know, to have to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. And forget about the children you're leaving behind or the woman who is, mm -hmm. or a man who, and you know the love of your life that uh, you are abandoning that's something you don't do unless it's extremely extremely you know necessary to you and even then you wonder so you have to make these decisions life is full of decisions about good and evil and uh, what you what you can do and how much you can excuse what you do by saying it's what I have to do for my own self well that sounds mm. Can you be that narcissistic? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. It's so is, is evil a substance? Yeah, yeah. Huh? So is, is evil a real thing or is it a, 
is it a kind of nothingness as Augustine thought or what is it in your perspective? Well, evil is very real. I think it's very real yeah. that uh, people are doing evil all day. We're seeing this constantly. We have so much going on in our, in our country right now, in our world, but in our country right now, that's pure evil. Uh, mm -hmm. Abandoning children at borders and not caring about their future. Yesterday came out in our news mm -hmm. that these children that are being separated from their parents just because of uh, an insanity about immigration here, um, mm -hmm. Are, uh, are being sexually abused. Boy, that's evil in my book. That's pretty evil. That's not abstract and it's not something else. It's not someone's shadow, that's evil. So uh, we, evil is a very real thing and uh, we have to do something about it in every case that it comes forward. Hmm. Okay. So uh, you mentioned that you're just finishing uh, a, a book on uh, the nature of therapy. Yes. Um, uh, I wonder if, what, what, if I could ask you uh, as a kind of uh, closing question, what, what you plan to write in the coming years, what you think you've left unwritten at this point? Oh, well, that's easy. There are a lot of things. Mm -hmm. I have so much to yeah. want to write. So yeah. part of it is, part of it is issues that I, that I, there's so many things I want to write. I want to write a book on, for years I've been wanting to write a book on, uh, for artists and the creative life mm -hmm. for artists. I think there's a lot that goes on in the life of an artist that hasn't been really spoken for yet. I'd like to do that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I've, uh, 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 I've, uh, I want to write more about, uh, about religion and spiritual life. There's a lot there that I haven't been able to do yet. Someone mm -hmm. suggested, a good friend of mine suggested I write a book called Care of the Spirit, I'm thinking about that. Um, I've, uh, uh, I've written several detective stories. I like the detective story as a form, as a genre. I like it quite a bit okay. when it's in good hands. And uh, yeah. so I've been writing those. Uh, I don't think I'm good at it enough yet to publish them, but I keep working yeah. at it. And if I can get them to the point where I feel they're okay, then I will publish those probably under a pseudonym. Because Who are your exemplars in that genre? Uh, well, I have a lot of them. Probably uh, Niall Marsh is one. Uh, mm. She's a New Zealand author, wrote 32 detective stories. Uh, mm -hmm. I like Colin Dexter very much, Inspector Morse. I think yeah. Colin Dexter's books are amazing. The, the television program I thought was also excellent and all the offshoots yeah. of it have been excellent, but yeah. uh, his writing was very, very good. I thought very good. Mm. And uh, uh, I, uh, I enjoyed reading uh, P.D. James, and uh, mm. there are just uh, several, I could just go on and on, so many authors that I like. There's, yeah. a, there's yeah. a writer here in America called uh, Jean Lesquois, who has written about San Francisco and uh, detective stories there that, um, I don't like all of his stories, but I think that he, generally speaking, he writes very good, mm. writes very well. And, I've, I've got a bunch, I have a whole library here of books about detective stories, like uh, there's one book, nice book I have here called The, the uh, the Mystery to a Solution. I like that, I like this book about yeah. what's going on in detective stories, the philosophical analysis of detective mm -hmm. stories. So I think there's a lot going on that is serious and important and I think the mystery of detective mysteries is related to the mysteries, the religious mysteries. Yeah, Trying yeah. to find out what's going on. It's a, you know, reading the clues. I like did, that. Did you watch? Did Did you watch that TV series, True Detective? No, I haven't seen that one yet. Should I do that? Oh yeah, I think it's the gold okay. standard when it comes to TV uh, oh. detective story, and it's very much a story that relates uh, the solving of a murder mystery to the solving of the great mysteries oh well um i will i'll start tonight i'll look at that tonight you, you have to watch season one season two is less good but i believe they're making a season three which will be oh, uh, which i hope will be as good as season one but each each season is self-contained yeah yeah good. well that's that's great so I, I i enjoy writing those those are like eating sweets yeah. you know i think they're, yeah. they're so yeah. they're so much fun to write have you written them yeah. 
you know, I wrote a detective novel a couple of years ago that I failed to get published. But yeah, so it was part of why I was asking you about failure earlier in the conversation. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, they're not easy to write. I mean, they're fun no. to write, but they're not easy to get them right. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. why I haven't published one yet. I, I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, okay. Well, um, I guess. Uh, I guess we can leave it there. We've been talking for a little over an hour, I think. Okay, good. Well, th yeah. well thank you, John. I really appreciate it. I didn't, I'd like to have heard more about what you're doing. Like, wh what are you doing yeah, you living? Feel free you to are? ask me anything you want to ask me. There's no. What are you, what are you, what are you, what are you doing living where you are now? Um, well, um, that too is part of why I asked you about the whole question of failure. Because um, I, I, I was working. After I finished graduate school, you know, I felt a bit disillusioned with the reductive ways that people were talking about the literature that I loved in universities and we're talking about human beings in universities and um, I got a job in Singapore and I worked there for about five and a half years, but my heart wasn't really in it and I was writing things that were not publishable in academic journals and so I decided to quit before I was kicked out and I spent a few years kind of flailing around trying to find alternative work and then started applying for academic jobs again and ended up where I am now in Siberia. Mm. And uh, for some reason, I got a notion to start doing podcasts about uh, three oh, months yeah. ago uh, to uh, alleviate my boredom with the kinds of conversations that are going on in academia. And uh, that's why I'm talking to you now. Oh, that's great. And where are you from originally? Uh, I'm from, I'm from uh, Ireland originally, from Cork. Yeah, from Cork? From Cork, yeah. So I, I, I doubled up on my teaching earlier in the year, and uh, so I'm able to spend a, a couple of months in Cork rather than having to be in Siberia at the moment. So you can see oh, I'm that's nice. sitting, looking across the city here. Yeah, very nice. Good. As I, as I, as I talk to you. That's great. That's that's great. I, yeah. um, I haven't spent too much time in Cork. I, 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 but my time there has been really wonderful. I once gave a gave a some kind of presentation, it wasn't a talk, but a, an all day discussion at uh, the university uh, mm. with social workers there. And I just loved it, I yeah. thought it was great. And they're, yeah. they're planning yeah. another one soon. Yeah. Um, well, you have an Irish background, do you? I don't, um, I, well, except for my family. But uh, when I was mm. 19, I was in this religious order. And uh, mm. a part we studied, our philosophy years were in uh, the north, the north of Ireland, County mm. Tyrone. I so I started going to Ireland when I was 19, and uh, mm. since then I spent a lot of time every, you know, every year. And I'm, I'm in Ireland for yeah. a while, mm. yeah. and I have family and work there. You know, I do things. Mm -hmm. I see. <laughs> I mostly in Dublin, though. I spend most of my time in Dublin. Yeah, you know, you said when you were speaking about Ficino and uh, the importance of being in a place that nourishes you. Uh, yeah, Dublin has all, rather than Cork has always been that for me, yeah, even though I'm from Cork. Uh, yeah. So Dublin was my spiritual home. Yeah, I think Dublin has a lot to offer if, if you uh, get yeah. into it. You know, if you're there, you can't be on the yeah. surface. You have to get into the city mm -hmm. and see what's going on, yeah. and get to know people. Yeah, yeah. It's a very interesting place. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I lived there for 10 years back in the 90s. Oh, did you? Place oh. moved to after I left Cork, yeah. Oh. And one year, I, I brought my my children over to uh, to Dublin for, uh, for a year mm. for them to go to school there. So we we lived in Blackrock then, mm, and uh, they went to school in Blackrock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, that was fun. Yeah, useful. Okay. So I'm I'm just curious as to what, where you're coming from. I have a better idea of it now, and I enjoyed our conversation very much, very very much. Excellent. Yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. It's a pleasure to talk to somebody whose books I've been reading for a few years. Yeah, very nice to talk to you because, you know, you know, I can talk to you like without thinking. I don't have to worry about whether, you know, certain things or, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, we can yeah. talk we kind of have a similar yeah. background some way yeah. to some extent. Yeah. Good. Well, I wish you luck yeah. and thank yeah. you for asking me. Yeah, same to you. Thank you for coming on the podcast. If you feel like it again sometime, let me know. Definitely, yeah. I will uh, come back to you if I'm still going in a year or so. Yeah, if it's still going.